Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. G'day, g'day, Clayton here. Had a really good conversation with Dave Carney. Got to know Dave in Cebu at his annual conference at the Virtual Business Partners Conference. Former advisor, then went on to teach a bunch of other advisors and some of the most successful advisors I know were taught by him on how to become better at advice. I mean, he's just built a 400 plus strong staff company with a a business partner over in the Philippines. Mind blowing, really, when you're walking up and down escalators and it took a while to get my head around, but had some really good insights, some of the best insights I've heard for, uh, for people that are in and around financial advice. So I wanted to get it on uh, tape, on record, on digital mediums, all that kind of jazz, and get it out there. So hopefully you enjoy. This episode is proudly sponsored by FE Analytics. Now, a number of XY advisors have already discovered this one-stop easy to use tool that helps with investment research, analysis, portfolio construction, ongoing monitoring, and client reporting. Find out how FE Analytics can help you improve your business process, manage your existing client base, and win new business by contacting Bruce Jenner via bruce.jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R, at financialexpress.net or visit financialexpress.net for more information. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Striker like Clayton here from XY Advisor. And today we are having a conversation with Dave Carney here from BBP, uh, who I got to actually spend a bit of time with uh, over in the Philippines, Cebu, at the annual conference, and really sort of start getting my head around what it means to outsource and, you know, the advantages, I guess, of using an outsourcing environment that's set up for Australian financial services rather than just generic outsourcing. And then during that time that I got to spend with Dave, um, I found out, you know, the background used to be an advisor, then an advisor coach. And I, I listened to you speak and I thought, wouldn't it be awesome if we could get you on a podcast? So here we are today, mate. Thanks for joining. Thank you. No, I uh, feel privileged. Uh, appreciate you giving me, you know, time to talk and, and all that sort of thing. It's a, it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Oh, man. Pleasure. So um, so let's kick it off. Like, when did you get into advice and how did you get into advice? And, you know, what, like, what's uh, what's your background? Yeah, yeah. Um, so coming up on 25 years, I guess, in, in the advice uh, game. But, you know, I... I go back early 90s. Uh, I actually was working uh, for a little fledgling bank or the State Bank of New South Wales in those days, and they had this uh, um, arm of the bank called First State Financial Services, um, and that sort of sparked my interest in sort of the funds management. They had a thing called the Imputation Fund back then, um, which um, was one of the, the stellar sort of performers, um, and I'd gone overseas to England for a, a what you know, do the sort of normal sort of backpacking type thing, come yeah. back sort of mid, mid-20s and decided to get into financial services, you know, because that had sparked my interest. So obviously Colonial bought out um, First State and then um, Commonwealth Bank bought them out and, you know, so First State Financial, that's where it all came from originally, but that was sort of my background. Um, worked in, you know, pretty much sort of 20 years as, a, as an advisor, um, you know, started in the banks, worked through, uh, had my own sort of, you know, practice uh, in Balmain in Sydney, had my own licence, um, you know, for a fair part of that time. Uh, and then, you know, sort of, um, I, I guess, took an opportunity, you know, saw that my passion really was around business. Uh, and I'd worked it with um, uh, a lot of sort of accounting referrals. I had a lot of business clients as, as you know, or business owners as clients. And I was just really interested in, you know, what really drove business, what really differentiated and what sort of difference could we make, you know, as advisors, you know, in that space with, with business owners. And I still think there's a long way for us to go. Um, but that was sort of an area that, that, you know, really, you know, led my passion. Mm. Yeah, right. And um, how come, how come, I guess, it's the question that, you know, you, you meet a lot of, and I'm a former advisor and I sold my practice. Um, what was it, and I'll tell you what, why I kind of 
uh, one of my main drivers, and I actually did an article about this in the IFA magazine when when I originally sold the company, and it was um, I sold my company because I was really frustrated with compliance not being tailored around delivering a better client outcome, but it was just simply about how, uh, you know, licensees could still funnel advisors down the paths that they wanted, but they could just tick enough boxes so that there was technically not, no contraventions of, of any regulations. And that really frustrated me. It just seemed like I was spending an awful lot amount of time making uh, other people look good rather than <laughs> the, the best outcome for my clients. So that really, that really irritated me. Um, why did you sell your company? Um, look, there was a, a, a you know, a couple of reasons, um, but my wife, you know, the, you know, personal reasons was uh, my wife actually got uh, cancer after uh, our daughter was born, and I was sort of, you know, working that typical long hours, um, just sort of trying to grow a business in my mid thirties, um, you know, having good success, um, but really came to that realization that, you know, um, you know what, you know, wh- where was I going? What was happening? And and so. I actually took an opportunity and, and sold half the business at that stage. And I had no idea before then that you could actually package up and sell, you know, a book of business and, and um, you know, but they were sort of, you know, sort of what we call, you know, my non-ideal clients, not necessarily the smallest clients, but uh, this was something that I'd gone through uh, the training with Jim Stackpool back in the mid 2000s and, and, you know, put me on this idea of new, new company, old company, you know, your legacy sort of stuff. So I did that. Um, but at the time, you know, with, you know, that, and then that sort of, I guess, you know, sparked me to sort of look at, well, okay, where do I really want to add the value? What's sort of looking at doing? Um, and I remember being in the, you know, the boardroom of my office with clients and a lot of these were either retired business owners or successful business owners, you know, you know, you know, in their fifties or so talking about, you know, planning, you know, retirement, these sorts of things. But I would use that as an opportunity to really try to understand what made, you know, these people successful. And there was two groups. Essentially, there was a group of people that were successful financially, um, but also ticked all the other boxes of, you know, what we would really say, you know, it had come, you know, they had a really fulfilled lives. Um, and they were a much smaller group than a lot of the other people who we would all say from a financial metric were successful, but it seemed to have come at a cost. Uh, and that was either the relationship with their children, you know, broken down marriages, uh, lack of interest, you know, health issues, these sorts of things. And I was just really intrigued at what set the difference apart. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, it's not rocket science and it's probably something people have all heard, you know, it was just that sense of, those that were really successful but kept a lot of the balance, they just worked smarter, not harder. It was obvious that they were surrounded themselves, you know, and, and that, you know, saying of worked on the business, not in the business, you know, those sorts of things. But they were just, it was very, it was very obvious to me that that was what they were about. And that became a real passion of, well, how do you sort of help those sorts of things. And I looked at myself and thought I was probably in the other camp. I was just trying to work harder but not work smarter. And so that led me to sort of, you know, I suppose a passion of sort of, you know, more wanting to work with business and on business and those sorts of things. And, and essentially that's then, you know, why I, 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 I sold the business. And I had an opportunity that was a roll-up with an accounting firm that I'd worked closely with that was selling. So I took the opportunity and, and uh you know, as they say, sort of went on a different path. Mm. And then, so I guess going to Jim Stackpool, you've got a bunch of, um, you know, training under your belt. You then decide to go into actually helping other advisors grow their companies. Yeah, look, I didn't start out that way because I was very conscious that, you know, one day you're an advisor, next day you're, you know, sort of trying to tell people, you know, what to, you know, like do. And I know it's going to be, you know, how do I, you know, that's not, sort of where I want to be, but I sort of looked around, I did some training, I, I worked with a, um, I did a bunch of training with a firm called Sherlaws, which had done a lot of work, 
you know, back in the 90s, early 2000s. Um, so learn a lot of the sort of EQ type stuff, um, yeah. you know, context of things. And then, you know, I actually, you know, found another a group um, which are called Gazelles, guy by the name of Vern Harnish who wrote, wrote a book called The Rockefeller Habits and um, now has a best-selling book called Scaling Up. Uh, and so I went over to the States and did a, a bunch of, you know, certification and training um, to become a Gazelles coach. And, you know, I then started, you know, just um, working with a whole bunch of different businesses. So it could be nice. service businesses, accounting firms. I was working with a, one of the larger um, hire companies in Australia um, and, and various different things. But as much as some of the frameworks and the way you apply sort of the um, business of business, you know, is, is applicable across, doesn't matter what, you know, any type of business, you know, my strengths in retail or manufacturing or those sorts of things, you know, weren't so good. What I did understand was service business. So yeah, you know, I had, you know, friends or colleagues and say, look, can you run us a strategy day? Can you help us with the sales team, you know, you know, with the advisors and, you know, can you do this sort of thing? And before I knew it, I guess I just realised that I, you know, there was some knowledge in addition to just the business coaching that you could apply. So I just started to specialise um, in financial services. Cool. Um, what would you say is the hallmark of a success? If you could say like one thing, this is what all successful financial planners have in common. Mindset. Uh, and what I mean by that is they're very clear on the mindset. So, and, and there's there's two paths to this, and I've, I often refer to it. It's it's you know, are you an advisor that owns a financial planning business, or are you a business owner in the advice game? Yep. Um, and the mindset you choose really will determine a lot of the factors and decisions and how you go about sort of things. And what I see is when people try to be a little bit of both, you know, and they try, you know, um, so, you know, if you're really, if, if your passion is really about the advice and the client relationships and those sorts of things, absolutely own that, uh, build a business around that um, and understand, you know, what the, what the strengths and weaknesses of that type of strategy is. But you can be a very good, profitable type business um, in that area. Um, the other option is if you're seeing yourself more as a business owner, where you're going to invest more is in the development of people and talent and systems and processes, probably to make something more scalable. Um, and I think um, the challenge with boutique type smaller businesses today is all the level of compliance and level of complexity that we're having that's making you know that harder just to to really be at you know the the, the small end. Um, and I think we're going to see the emergence of more sort of, you know, you know, firms, not licenses, but firms that are sort of, you know, got 15, 20 partners, you know, advisors, you know, general manager or managing director, proper, you know, that sort of structure, uh, you know, maybe similar to what we'd see in a mid-tier mid sort of accounting. But I think being clear on the mindset, um, that helps to make, you know, the, the critical decisions and where you invest your time, your energy, those sorts of things. Um, so we got introduced through uh, Roxy, Andrew yep. Rock, and, uh, and one of the coolest things that I loved about uh, the announcer group um, business was that you'd go into the office and you would see everyone's personality traits and everyone's, um, you know, there were insightful pieces on each of the employees and there was certainly a hum and a buzz um, that was in the office that just sort of led, you know, you could just feel that people were turning up very focused on delivering uh, a great outcome for the clients and a great outcome for the business. And yep. I guess you could summarise that as saying it had a really good culture. Now, one of the... Uh, I guess that's probably the first time I'd ever walked into an office and seen such a specific focus on culture. And Roxy would say to me, you know, like, 
Dave Carney had a, had, a, had a big part to play in this. And then when I was listening to you talk, uh, you had a lot to say on this culture piece. Um, what, can, you, can you give advice as a tip on how to deliver great culture in, mm-hmm. their, in their work environment? Sure. Um, so let, let, me, let me just, uh, you know, there's a couple of things, right? You know, in, in business, I think there's four key areas that you need to get right. You know, um, it doesn't matter what the business is, et cetera, and they are people, strategy, the execution of that strategy, and managing cash, cash flow, building up, you know, like, you know, ensuring that you've got the ability to, you know, build a war chest to take opportunities. So just, you know, those sorts of things. So, you know, um, in advice businesses, cash has always been pretty good. We don't have to be chasing up, you know, our accounts, you know, pay our receivables, these sorts of things. You know, we've got, you know, that had been a, a fairly, you know, strong part of the, the business model. Um, but when I look at it and I go, it doesn't really matter whether you, you know, you know, what type of business, at the end of the day, if you could only choose one thing to focus on, it's always going to, it's, it's, it's wherever the, you know, biggest drama is, but also the biggest opportunity, it's around people, right? Um, because you get the right people, they'll help you with the strategy. You know, they'll they'll give you the discipline around execution. Um, and the thing about the culture side of it is that, um, you know, it's all about managing discretionary effort, right? So every day, any employee, that discretionary effort um, is, you know, if they really are doing, you know, the minimum to keep their job, or do they really care and they really invested in what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to do? That's that discretionary effort. And you get good, talented people, give them an environment where they really feel like they can, you know, add, and they'll give you lots of the discretionary effort. So that then turns up, you know, meaning that, you know, people feel connected, they feel committed, you know, those sorts of things, um, but you get results, right? Mm. Um, and, you know, you only have to look at it. I, 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 when I talk with my some of my staff, you know, I run them through, um, you know, an induction, you know, where we always talk about, you know, the importance of you know, what is a culture-led business because we talk about being a culture-led business at Virtual Business Partners and, you know, that's certainly what, you know, announce awards as, as a business, you know, is culture-led. Um, and, you know, the importance that we talk about there is that we go is culture happens whether you design it or not right so we've all worked in an organization where the culture may not be the ones that the owners or the founders or the executives think it is right so you know because they might have said oh here's some values and this is sort of what we stand for but there's no real commitment to live it every day Um, and so what happens is you end up with a culture that isn't the one that you really want so we're like, well, why not design a culture that you love and why not sort of really push, you know, energy into that sort of thing? So for us, um, you know, the you know, so if you look at it, it's all about people, uh, getting the right people and then giving them, you know, an environment for them to flourish. Yeah. Um, you know, and that sort of thing. And the important thing with culture, it doesn't matter um, – what culture, you know, like it's it's your culture to design and be clear on, but it's about being then really committed to living it. And so if you're going to violate things um, and one day, you know, say this is what we stand for, but then, you know, al- you know allow things, you know, to occur that sort of, you know, is, is contrary to that, then, you know, that's that's when, you know, you'll be judged and when, you know, you'll, you'll you know, you'll be find it difficult to sort of sustain the culture. Yeah, it's a yes. It's like a lot of things, isn't it? Um, it's freedom within boundaries, but just being really clear on what it is you stand for and what it is that you don't stand for, um, and then that just compounded over a long period of time. Yeah, kind of sets a sets a set of spoken rules, which then I guess translate into unspoken rules, which I guess another another name is for culture. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you know, and you know, and, and if you look at you know the the S and P five hundred, you look at the top places to work. You know, I've got this the, the slide there that shows you know the performance of the best places to work. Um, you know, you get a ten times return 
um, relative to the average benchmark. Um, so the great places to work not only have a good environment, but are actually you know, creating great results. And so the days of having a, a leadership style, which is very command and control, um, is, is, is not necessarily, you know, now, you know, that if you're in the army, oh. that's all you, you want, right? Because the results are people die, you know, we're going into battle, we need discipline, that sort of thing. That is absolutely the right culture yeah. when you're in the defence forces, right? Um, so that culture, very clear on it. Um, and I think Simon Sinek talks about, you know, the, the idea of leaders eat last, you know, which is a, a great book that, um, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've read and, you know, absorbed and, you know, all those sorts, of, you know, but he talks about that's the discipline through the, you know, the Marines in the US that, you know, the leaders are not there, to, you know, they're there to sort of when it matters, they'll go last as far as, you know, if there's not enough, you know, that sort of environment. So mm. that's the culture is, is, is ideal. And then I look at the environments that, you know, we work in, we need people, you know, it's a knowledge, you know, we're, we're transferring knowledge. We want people to be engaged. We need people to really care about clients. And so, you know, where I think it's so important that we really have that great client relationship, well, we've got to make sure that we have great, you know, great culture and we care about the staff um, because they're the ones at the end of the day that's going to transfer that sort of feeling across to, you know, across to clients. Yeah, that's a really good point. So um, I guess... You know, turning up in sort of the, the level of the multiple levels, uh, which I was kind of I was joking about with everyone. You know, the the multiple levels of uh, shopping center. You know that that you've sort of just taken over there in Cebu as you, as the company gets growing and then so focused on culture. What's What's really interesting is you know you taking you you can say these words. But then to watch it play out and to turn into this multiple hundred employee, multiple story shopping center office, um, it's kind of, it's really surreal. Like I wasn't expecting to see that level of in just organization and that level of, uh, of, people working together in such a cohesive manner because it seems it seems you know pretty crazy for a couple of Aussie guys to sort of set up a company and then fast forward a handful of years and then you've got this behemoth and then I guess what's really struck a chord with me is watching sort of the success that you've had there and then listening to what you're saying about culture and all these things it demands sort of a, a much uh much more authority than just if someone's saying it and they don't have that sort of, uh, you know, large business behind them. So I guess, um, uh, you know, talking about culture and talking about the people and everything like that, let's talk about uh, outsourcing because I outsourced a couple of times. I think I mentioned to this to you while I was overseas, you know, when I first started looking to outsourcing, I hired someone and they worked from home. Um, and they didn't really know anything about financial planning, let alone Australian laws and, and financial planning. And then that that was quite limited in its success in that, uh, you know, ultimately I just ended up sort of getting them to do administration tasks. And, and, and even then, you know, I was, a, I was a bit concerned around just, you know, e- even looking at emails with access and security and, and things like that. Um, so it didn't last too long and I sort of had a negative taste in my mouth about it, but then I thought the solution would be to use an agency. So this agency finds good people, right? So, okay, well, you know, so they still work from home, but it, you pay an agency and I guess they're the yep. ones that find good people. So we did that for a while and, uh, that was more successful, certainly. Um, and there was certainly, they, they had more experience uh, in admi- administration tasks. But still, it was still um, sort of, I guess, you know, I hadn't put the time and effort in. But at the same time, 
because they were just working from home, they had no frame of reference for what financial planning was and, again, what financial planning in Australia was. Um, so what do you find, I guess, specifically for Australian-based financial planners, what are the main uh, mistakes that you see uh, Australian-based financial planners making um, when they attempt to outsource? Um, look, it's uh, there's probably a couple of elements to that. You know, the easier one is to say um, what we find is there's a lot of assumed knowledge, right? So just within our businesses where, you know, typically, you know, uh, uh, smaller businesses, maybe, you know, less than 20 staff, those sorts of things. So we don't have, you know, as advice, you know, we don't have training <clears throat> training divisions or HR departments that set up, you know, learning and development, those sorts of things. So when someone comes in, a lot of what they have to do is, is just learn things on the, on the go. And, yeah. you know, when we lose a really good staff member, what we realise is we've lost a lot of this knowledge, you know. So... You know, we're big on knowledge capture these days. We're working on a bunch of stuff that, you know, ensures that we can find better ways to sort of capture that knowledge and use technology to be able to search and find that sort of thing. So you don't have that, you know, that knowledge loss. Um, yeah. But when it comes to outsourcing, often then there's just that assumed knowledge and we're sort of, we're constantly amazed at, you know, how, you know, um, when people are trying to outsource some things that, you know, they don't, you know, they're just not used to sort of building the level of detail that's needed to, you know, maybe help someone sort of understand and, and get the context of what's happening. So um, that would probably be, you know, one area. Uh, the other is just um, assuming that, you know, if you're going to use uh, an, a, an outsourcing firm that, you know, I guess all are the same um, or that they will, you know, there's a lot of, you know, what I see a lot is, you know, a lot of people say they'll be able to look after things and do things, but, you know, um, how committed are they really to understanding what you do? So for us, we're just specialists. We only do work in financial services. We don't do any other areas. Um, and we really see ourselves as a training organisation. So, you know, that's what we're about is training people in the skill sets to sort of assist. Now, I would say that if, if you, you know, when you talk about, you know, outsourcing just to someone home-based, yeah. um, you know, I yes, that's going to be the cheapest option. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in this regime of, you know, compliance, licensing, all those sorts of things, it's fraught with danger. Um, and not that I, you know, particularly say in the Philippines, and that's really, you know, what I understand. I don't, you know, know other... Other, other countries, but certainly in the Philippines, I would not be, you know, I'm not concerned about them, you know, doing something crazy with the data. Yeah. Uh, but working at home, they don't have the firewalls, they don't have the protections, they don't have the systems in place. Um, they have, you know, internet's pretty lousy. So their efficiencies, um, and it, so all of those sorts of things are stuff that I would, you know, be concerned about. Um, you know, from a, you know, when you get to the Privacy Act, there's two parts of the Act you've really got to look at. One is, you know, are you disclosing that you may be using third parties and they may be, over, you know, overseas? Most right. privacy, you know, most privacy guides today, you know, cover that. Uh, and then the second one is, you know, have you taken reasonable steps to protect the data? Um, I don't think with a home base you would you would probably be able to tick that box, you know, if, if push came to shove on that one. But um, if you look at, now again, if you're just getting them to do a logo or update some websites or do some social media or that sort of stuff, no problems. But as soon as you start talking about client data, um, client information, obviously everything we deal with is, is private and sensitive. Yeah. Um, the next level is, you know, you could look at, you know, where we talk about, um, you know, outsourcing or, you know, in, in, in some respects that you might even call it like insourcing where, you're setting up your own team offshore. Um, and yeah. if you're probably going to get to about 20, 25 people, it probably starts to make sense economically where you may actually go and set up your own company, um, you know, deal with all of that um, and, and, you know, deal with everything to do with it, you know, in, in somewhere like the Philippines, maybe rent some place, do that sort of stuff. Um, less than that, then it's sort of what the other option is what is, is called seat leasing. 
Um, and that's what, what is it called, sorry? Seat leasing. So you're essentially leasing a seat. And that's probably where you see the largest um, take up at the moment, you know, where companies are sort of like, you know, they've got the facilities, the infrastructure, they'll have a hiring process um, and they'll put someone in front of you, et cetera, and they'll, you're essentially leasing that seat, that, that desk, you know, and you've got that staff member, but you're totally responsible for everything. Yeah. Um, and, again, depending on, you know, time, commitment, what you're looking at doing, you know, that, again, is, you know, what we saw was, you know, it's extremely hard. Um, you know, in the, you know, like all of it, you know, in an accounting world, it's easier to find people with accounting qualifications, even though they might need to learn the Australian tax system and that sort of thing. Um, that's probably a, a, a quicker transition where we're often finding people that, you know, are accountants or, you know, all of our staff are degree qualified, but they, you know, might be in, uh, you know, business degrees or teaching or whatever. But you've really got to start from scratch. Teaching yeah the Australian laws, regulations, superannuations, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, And so, again, it's just depending, it really comes down to what investment of time and energy does the practice want to play? Because, you know, at a seat, you know, those that sort of area, um, you may be able to, you know, do quite well, but there's going to be a bigger commitment of time and and those sorts of things. We We just felt that, you know, the key for us, is it's about training and developing our people. And then, you know, what we saw is it's all about creating a relationship. So whatever way you you look at this, whatever, you know, um, options you take, it is all about still building a relationship, right? And so those that just want to hand over tasks, have them done, come back, you know, it, you're not going get, to get quite the outcome. You know, we talk a lot about the difference between a customer and a client. And so, you know, if I work in the call centre for Telstra, I deal with customers all day. I try to help them, you know, but there's a lot of frustrations. We've all had that type of experience. Yeah. Um, But at the end of the day, there's no ongoing relationship. What we teach our guys, it's all about building client relationship because you're dealing with the same people day in, day out. Um, And when... Certainly, you know, Filipinos, when they get more confident and they feel like, you know, part of the team and part of, you know, that that sort of environment, you're going to get just so much more back, you know, and, you, you know, they're going to be, you know, we, you know, they're going to be much more likely to challenge something if they don't think it's right. Which is, uh, and which is super valuable, right? Super valuable, yeah. You know, and, and you know, but culturally, it took me a while to really figure this out, but, you know, what we find is, their biggest fear um, is offending you. Wow. Yeah, right. So if they bring something up and maybe you've explained something and you they didn't understand it, their natural thing is they don't want to say, oh, I didn't don't really understand because that might offend you. Yeah, right. And we go, like, that's the least of our worries. Mm. We'd much rather them to go, well, hang on, I just didn't quite understand that. Um, can you just repeat that? But their fear, you know, that's something that we're always sort of, you know, battling with a little bit. But this, you know, if they're going to, you know, suggest something, you know, um, they're often concerned, you know, they're, they're, they're often historically, I suppose, the way that, you know, sort of, you know, been dealt with over the many hundreds of years, you know, in, in different, you know, whether the Spanish, the US, the Chinese, you know, whoever's controlled, is they're very much there to serve, right? right. But, you know, but when they're asked to sort of, um, you know, come up and, and, and have ideas, they may have them, but they probably don't want to suggest something because they might, you might then get offended, you know. Um, and wow. so that's where we just break that down and, and, you know, look at that. So, you know, there's some things. Another big tip that I would suggest is um, dealing, you know, with outsourcing is um, culturally in the Philippines, you know, yes means yes. Yes means no, <laughs> and yes means maybe. <laughs> so that's a challenge in itself. So we do some training around that, like we talk to our clients, you know, never ask a question that is, um, you know, closed end. So never say, like, do you understand that? Mm. They'll go, yes. 
right? And again, it's, you know, because, you know, that's yes could be yes, no, or maybe. Um, so what we say is just ask, you know, just say, look, can you just, can you just repeat back exactly what I need you to do? Can you just summarise what your next points are? So you get them to sort of articulate, you know, um, rather than saying, you know, yes. And again, that's just this cultural thing. Yeah. I mean, it went a bit off tangent there, but hopefully that sort of. No, works. no, mate. I actually think that was really valuable. Um, hey, uh, so one of the things that I'm noticing about financial advice is that technology, because of so much changes that's happening in the industry, and technology is so difficult, right? Like just tech in itself to build, to update, to, oh, man, it's so hard. So um, one of the things I've noticed is that the net promoter scores for basically all financial planning technology yep. is really low. It's really low. And, and there's no one that's nailing it. Um, and that's more of a symptom of, as I mentioned, tech being hard to update and also like there being so many updates. So, so many updates, um, legislatively regulations from licensees, um, and then it's very hard to update software. So there's this huge lag. And because we've had the Royal Commission and all this stuff, um, there's all these changes coming in. There's all these additional, um, you know, requirements. But the tech just is not there to fix the gap. It's just it, everything's coming back as, you know, I've heard some places uh, say that, you know, in some licensees that, that um, compliant advice is below 50%, right, which is just – crazy so if tech can't solve the problem or at least is slow to solve the problem um how on earth and and like this is sort of a a genuine question like how on earth can an advisor trust anyone even themselves even their tech even onshore staff let alone offshore staff that the advice that's getting produced is actually compliant yeah um yeah, that's, you know, I mean, that's a challenge for us. I mean, we've got a, over 100-odd people in our advice team, um, you know, that's not doing the admin, but that's, you know, we've got about, say, 70 or so of those that are, um, you know, the you know, power planners. Right. Uh, QA, you know, our own QA team, some managers and some people in training, et cetera. Um, but, you know, that's huge for us because, you know, um, you know, dealing with different licensees, I think we have about 16, 18 different licensees. So, you know, not only have we got all the different softwares um, that we sort of have to, you know, deal with, yeah. uh, you know, and at the moment I think we, you know, we use X-Plan, Coin, Advisor Logic, Midwinter, you know, um, and, and, you know, that's just on the, you know, maybe the plan writing. Then we have nu- numerous ones for CRMs and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then you've got all the licensee standards, you know, yeah. and, clients and all those sorts of things. So, um, you know, that, that you know, that's a, you know, real genuine challenge and one that we, you know, we're finding that, you know, you know, we're working closer and closer with some of the licensees um, to, you know, be really clear on what their standards are and then, you know, so that we're able to interpret, et cetera. Um, you know, for us, you know, we made a decision that we – you know, on an advice side, we only work with people where they've got the ability to have a full-time resource. Um, so that means that that person is working solely for them uh, and we build out some, you know, we use some technology, we use some pretty good, um, uh, you know, checklists that are um, intelligent sort of checklist things that we can set up a whole preferences that, you know, walk through. So every time we do a, a plan document, you know, within there is embedded all the standards, you know, all the, you know, might be the advisor sort of quirks, the things that they, you know, want specifically put into a, a plan, but also then all the compliance stuff. And we can work through that checklist. And that, you know, that there's a lot that goes into that to sort of give, you know, uh, confidence around that that's coming back as, you know, compliant document, but we're forever having to update that as things evolve, et cetera. Um, you know, so yeah, it is a. I guess you know whether you're outsourcing in, so whether you've got your own power planning. Um, you know, staying relevant with that is probably you know now you know is is a is a is a key component. Um, you know, of of what an advisor and we, we see 
some of the firms we're working with, what we call the emergence of what we call an advice manager. Okay. Um, and that advice manager is someone that, you know, um, you know, may may sit across both front stage and backstage of the business. So front stage, they may, you know, sit in the odd meeting and provide some real technical, you know, knowledge around some things. So they're typically quite technically skilled, um, but they're actually then managing the compliance, the ongoing, but not necessarily writing the plans. So not a senior para planner, but someone that's more overseeing, you know, then working quite closely, say, with an outsourcing, you know, system, uh, making sure that things like, you know, the requirements, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have is advisors not fully understanding why the amount of stuff that's needed to produce a compliant document is needed, you know, not understand, you know, and so stuff is missing sort of at the, at the, at the start. So, you know, that person that can filter that or educate the advisor on the importance of why this stuff is needed to produce the compliant documentations, you know, it's, 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 it's a sort of critical role that I think, you know, people need to be looking at in the future. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because, um, again, when I had my company, it was, you know, I'd, I'd get these new licensee expectations, just get emailed to me, and then all of a sudden it was like, okay, as of today, these additional things need to be looked at. And it's it was... You know, in, for lack of a better term, for for a business owner, it's really difficult to sort of just change up your process like that overnight. And um, yeah, it's it's such a difficult thing that I, I I really feel you know bad for advisors considering how much they are going through right now. And I don't know if you if you if you're sort of keeping up to date with with everything, but there but there is. I mean, what I read last week that. It's looking like advisors won't be able to charge any advice fees from super moving forward, uh, upfront and ongoing. Uh, certainly for my super accounts and then huge restrictions even on choice. So, like, I don't know what kind of eyeballs you have over the percentages of fees that are received from super, but that is almost, you know, that's directly going after the revenue model of, I'd suggest many, many businesses, a high percentages of businesses, and maybe while not all advice is done like that, you know, it's certainly a substantial amount. So, man, that's that's going to be a huge, huge game changer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, you know, we're, you know, we've got a lot of disruption happening. Um, you know, and, and, you know, we're seeing that firsthand. Um, you know, people are really conscious of the cost to serve, uh, looking at, you know, a lot more detail. I mean, you know, the reason we started the business was really about that working smarter, not harder that I talked about is that, yeah. you know, you've got to, you know, are we really clear on, you know, where our value is to a client? And, you know, can we bring down the cost so we can invest more in that relationship, in the engagement, in the stuff that they care about? Now, somewhere along the lines in the last five, six years, what's also happened is this big, you know, and a whole bunch of additional amount of sort of compliance, et cetera. But, you know, if the way that we charge and fees, et cetera, is going to be fundamentally changed, you know, that makes the value proposition, the client experience, those sorts of elements far, far more important to get right. Um, you know, I'm just reading a book called The Experienced Economy. Uh, it was written a while back, but they've just done an updated, you know, uh, version of that, you know, but that's what we're in, you know, and we need to be able to have a, you know, really cool experience um, mm-hmm. where people really look forward to coming in and spending time with their advisor. They go out energised, you know, the, the experience is just, um, you know, something that, is valued, uh, then, you know, you know, th- then, you know, where we charge and how we charge, you know, um, you know, shouldn't matter. Um, but you know, it, it's going to, it's going to mean a lot of change and it's going to mean a lot of people are going to leave the industry. And, um, you know, I think one of the bigger, you know, that, that, that's a challenge, but I think the bigger challenge moving forward is for firms is where they're going to have they you know, the days of being able to recruit talent, um, you know, out of a, out of the larger institutions, these sorts of things, um, they're just not going to be there. So you're going to have to develop your own um, 
plans and bring people in and, and develop them over a number of years. And I think, you know, that again, you know, means you've got to have better training, better, better um, you know, career propositions, these sorts of things. Now, you know, this is not unusual. This is exactly how law, law firms work. It's exactly how accounting firms work. They bring in, you know, people, you know, they might have, you know, 10, 10 or 20 people, you know, as graduates and, you know, five or 10 of those make it to sort of, um, you know, a manager and one or two of those make it, you know, up to a partner over the, you know, longer periods of time. Um, what you talked about with compliance, I think it's, you know, critical um, that that's why we're going to need to see people start to get together, band together and actually, you know, you know, create, um, you know, larger sort of communities of advice, you know, sort of, you know, you know, a, you know, a business with, you know, maybe, you know, five or ten advisors sort of in that, not just one or two. Um, I think, you know, because you need to be able to afford to have that advice manager, that person that might be able to sit across and understand all that compliance. And I don't think we can purely just then rely on the licensees to be able to deliver all that because, you know, that might, you know, that that's changing quite a bit, you know, that model, you know, um, where they're really subsidised by the product that they could create or manufacture or click the ticket on uh, is, is not going to be you know, sustainable in the future. Yeah. Um, mate, thanks for all of this. Uh, if, if there's an advisor out there thinking, yeah, okay, I'd like to pursue this a little bit further, um, how does someone reach out to you and find out more? Um, oh, probably just websites the easiest. There's a bunch of materials on there, lots of... Um, you know, so we've got some videos and things from clients and their experiences and those sorts of stuff. So, um, you know, I think that's that's probably easiest. So, you know, that's just um, virtualbusinesspartners.com.au. They can find out more. Um, and also just if they want to know more about how we deliver on culture and those sorts of things, you know, yeah. we, have a, we, have, we have a separate page that's all targeted at, at, at getting talent um, and there's a bunch of stuff on there. So, you know, you know they can sort of go there. I mean... You know, because for me, you know, if I was sort of giving advice to business, you know, financial services businesses today about what they should really look at it, um, I think there's a really good book, a uh, guy by the name of John Spence called Awesomely Simple. Um, cool. But he, he has a formula for business and, you know, the formula is talent plus culture plus extreme client focus. Right, um, and you put that in brackets. Times uh, execution discipline equals success. <laughs> right? And so, you know, if I look at that, it's it is really it, you know it's going to be about you know how do you find the best talent? Yeah. You know, how do you nurture them and those sorts of things? You know, great you know great firms have great talent, uh, and you've got to find out well how do you really create? How do you find those really good people? And it might be then putting them through a journey of of you know, how they come through the business and, and succeed and, and those sorts of things, not just finding someone that's external um, that's been successful but actually, you know, being able to profile those sort of people. Having a great culture which gives allows them to play to their best, you know, a good work environment but also means that, that you get that extreme client focus. You know, I often hear about firms saying that they're, you know, client-centric or customer-focused but, you know, you drill that down, what does that really mean? You know, what, you know, are, you know, is every decision we're making, you know, really, you know, in the in the best interest of clients? How do we really engage our clients, you know, in, in a more meaningful way? What's really important to them? And, you know, then, you know, the execution discipline is really about just choosing one or two things to sort of focus on each quarter or each, you know, every, every period and make sure that, you, you know, you actually get it done. Um, they're the sort of, you know, that would be the... The, the sort of tips that I'd, you know, give to anyone sort of, um, you know, be clear on that model, look at those sort of four or, four or so areas. Yep. And that would, you know, be successful. Mm. Awesome, man. Well, look, thank you so much. Um, actually, I'll just quickly ask, what's that page on you on your website that people can go to to get the stuff? Uh, there'll just be a link on there called uh, Careers. Uh, is that the one to, and that, that'll go across to the cult, sort of careers and culture page? Yeah. We've got two uh, Facebook pages. We have our, 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 our again, VBP careers and culture, uh, I think it is, which is all targeted at finding talent. 
So, you know, you know, we have two sort of keys to our marketing and it's about finding the best people um, and then obviously finding clients, et cetera. But, you know, we have, a, you know, quite a different tactic around finding best people sort of thing. That's really interesting. Yeah. So you put almost as much effort into how to fill the pipeline of good people into your company as you do is how to find the good clients to come into your business. Uh, probably more. Oh, wow. Yeah, really? Probably more. We probably put more emphasis. But, you know, we're now a firm of, you know, like 400 odd staff. Yeah. You okay. Know, so, we're, you know, we've got, you know, and, you know, we've got a lot of, you know, demand and, you know, we, I just, the last thing I want to do is ever, you know, compromise the quality of the talent because um, it does vary, you yeah. know, like in anything, you know. So you want to, you know, create the best. We get a pretty high referral rate from existing staff, you know, that are happy with what we're doing and how we're doing it and all those sorts of things. But, you know, we you know, constantly need to be looking at, you know, finding the best people, you know, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, so we, there's a lot that we emphasize on that from a, from a marketing point of view. And that's a lot of what the culture is about, you know. Yeah, it's, 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 sorry, sorry to interrupt. It's just really interesting you brought that up because um, I know that there's a, a handful of advisors right now that are looking to expand and they just, they're really struggling to find good um, advisors to bring into their company. And I've been sort of saying to them, look, I mean, you're spending a lot of time trying to find good clients. What effort are you doing besides spending $500 on a CCAD to find good staff? And yeah. then it's so it's really interesting to hear you say that you're, you're even spending more time on how to acquire good staff than you are <laughs> on acquiring good clients. So, um, it, it, yeah, it really makes a point that I guess an expanding business should really be focused kind of permanently on what they are doing for their funnel of good people to bring on. Yeah, uh, without doubt, without doubt. I mean, that you know, the, that's the thing that really differentiates, you know, I think, you know, those really successful businesses is if they've got, you know, the best talent, you know, and we define A players as sort of the top 10%, you know, for that pay grade, you know, if you were able to sort of, you know, if, if that's what you've got and you're not, not going to have, a, you know, 100% A players, but, you know, if you have more, you know, more than average, you're going to win. Um, and, you know, you look at the lifetime value of a client and, you know, people can sit there and we can do some numbers, et cetera. Um, but what's the, you know, what's the lifetime value of a, of a really good staff member or, advice, you know, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's client times X. So, you know, there's a thing that we talk about, which is a virtual bench. Um, so how many people have you got on a list that are people that one day you might want to work with? That you know that you know, and you know, are you sort of nurturing that? Um, taking you know, catching up, having a coffee, you know, chatting to them, you know, these sorts of things. So, you know, when people say, "Oh, I can't find good people," I'd go, "Well, if you're just doing a CCAD, you know, that's probably not the you know that you know, like we need to go a little bit deeper than that. You know, you need to have a, a clear strategy on how we're going to sort of try to build people." You know, are we clear on the vision for the business? Are we clear on what we're trying to achieve? Because, you know, when you're trying to articulate, good people can work anywhere, right? Yeah. So they are as much interviewing you yeah. uh, as you them. So, you know, that's where there needs to be a lot more investment. Um, that's where I'd be, you know, focusing because um, there's plenty of good people on the move at the moment. You know, there's plenty of disruption. So if you're a... If you're a firm that's really clear on the vision, the values, what you're trying to achieve, where you want to take things, et cetera, um, and you can articulate that well, you've got a good culture, you know, and you've got a great client value proposition, you know, that's when you'll get some great talent coming through. But if you haven't got those pieces, um, well, then, you know, don't be too surprised. And I guess, you know, that's part of why we see an outsourcing is really important. Um, you know, in our whole time, we've never seen any of our clients use us as a way to retrench staff. Um, they may not, you know, if a staff member leaves or something, they may add to our team, but it's all about freeing up good people, mm. actually focus on the stuff, you know, that's going to deliver value for the business and going to engage them, um, you know, because that's what really matters for, you know, um, that's, that's how you win, right, is you've got your good people. If you're paying, you know, good people in Australian wage dollar terms to then do you know you know lower valued work um that's 
you know, you're going to be up against it. But if you can free them up to actually do the, you know, do the stuff that's really important, that's what's going to make a difference. You know, one of our firms, you know, I'll finish, I know you probably, one of our firms, the greatest thing they said to me was they have one girl that now on a Friday can ring up all their clients in the implementation phase and just tell them where they're at, what's happening, why things are stuck, you know, we're still waiting to get the trustee from the lawyer. We're still waiting on this information. We haven't finished with the, you know, whatever the, and help manage expectation. And he said, look, it's not rocket science. You know, that's, you know, it's about, you know, and, but the clients just value that so much because yeah. we live in this world of where they expect everything to happen straight away, yet it might take six weeks to implement a piece of advice. Yeah. But being able to do that, and he said, we, just never, you know, that was always seen as, a, you know, something that we just never got to because everyone was too busy running around just trying to complete a bit of business, do whatever. Yes. Man, that is fantastic. Dave, thanks so much for your time today, mate. Um, really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's party in Cebu in 12 months' time. Cool. No worries. Thanks, Clayton. Appreciate it. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Bye.